Welcome. Сайн байцгаана хүн төзөгчтэй. Өнөөдөр ороо манай де факто нэвтрүүлгийг зочноор Канад улсын амбан захирагч Эрхэмсэг ноён Давид Джонстон оролцож байна. Эрхэмсэг ноён Давид Джонстон Канад улсын амбан захирагч Дэвид Джонстон мэрэгжлийн гараага 1966 онд Кюнси их сургуулийн хуйлзан факультетэд ассистент профессор орхилэн. 1968 онд Торонтогийн их сургуулийн хуйлзан факультет руу шилтсэн. 1974 онд Western Ontario их сургуулийн хуйлзан факультетийн декан. 1979 онд Маккелли их сургуулийг удирдан дэд захирлын үүргийг үздэгж байгаа. 1994 оны 7 дугаар сард Маккелли их сургуульд эргэж учин хуйлзан профессор ор ажилласан. 1990 оны 6 дугаар сард Waterloo их сургуулийн 5 дахь ерөнхийлөгчөөр томилогдсон ажилласан. Түүнийг Америкийн нэгдсэн улсын Харвардын их сургуулийн гадаадад ажиллаж байгаа багш нарын зөвлөлийг өдөрсөн анхны гадаад хөнгөж онцолдог. Тэр бээр зохиогч ирүүлэн хамтран битсэн 20 гаруй номоо хэвлүүлсэн. Өдгөө арваад ихтэй сургуулийн хүндэд доктор Канадын төрийн дээд одон болох Канадын одонгоор шагналсан төрийн хүн билээ. Ноён Джонстон 1966 онд Кюнси их сургуулийн хуулийн диплом, 1965 онд Кембриж их сургуулийн хуулийн диплом, 1963 онд Харвард их сургуулийн бакалаврын эрдмийн зэрэг хамгаалсан. Тэр бээр Харвардад суралцаж байх хугацаанда Бүх Америкийн хоккейн шигшээ багт хоёр удаа багтаж Харвардын спортын алдар хүндийн тэнхэнд нэрээ мөхөлсөн тамирчтай нэг юм. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to uh, show de facto. Uh, thank you for coming to the show. And uh, so how, how is your program is going on so far? Well, this is a wonderfully welcoming country and we've only been here a short period of time, but uh, already one senses the great warmth of the Mongolian people and the great relationship that has built up over the 40 years that Canada has had diplomatic relations with Mongolia. We uh, Mongolians are so happy to have you here in Mongolia. Uh, it is the highest uh, ranking official visit to this country from uh, Canada, which is very similar to ours. And we look at Canada in very different ways. But before we want to talk about the, before we talk about the Canada and Mongolia relations, I would like to ask several uh, questions, which has to do with your work you have been doing uh, many years and uh, the issues that Mongolians youth is more interested in. For example, how do you find the role of sport education in the, in the, in general overall uh, education? Oh, I could speak it for hours on sport. I love sport of all kind. Um, sport, first of all, for physical fitness. Um, second, sport for young people learning how to interact with one another, play with one another. Uh, third, um, sport is a great ambassador, uh, a great uh, diplomatic initiative between and amongst uh, nations. Um, but I think most of all, uh, for children to learn how to play early on and then carry the activities of play throughout their life uh, means that uh, one has a healthy mind and healthy body. You have been uh, in All-America team at Harvard and uh, before you were playing with two brothers uh, in the school, and, uh, you, you are the uh, f uh, fame of honor in uh, Harvard. And uh, hockey is such a sport that, for example, Mongolians could play a lot, but what is the secret that Canadians are playing so well hockey. I suppose because we have lots of ice uh, and I think uh, we learn to skate uh, just as soon as we learn to walk. But hockey is a wonderful game because it's, it's the fastest game there is on foot. With skates you can go 50-75% faster than you can by, by running. And secondly, it's a game that does involve high degree of individualistic skills of being able to do very creative things, but always within the context of the team. And therefore, one learns that ability to 
blend one's talents with the talents of the other members of your team with a common purpose to stop the opponents from scoring goals and for you to concentrate the play in the opponent's end and, 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 score, and score goals. And finally, it's a game that is at such fast pace that typically a player is only on the ice for perhaps a, a one minute or one minute and 15 seconds, very often changes on the fly, is off for two or three minutes, and then is back on for this very intensive burst of speed. So it's a game that contains a high pace throughout. But most of all, it's a game that's just a lot of fun to play, and boys and girls play it as well. Exactly. I think that's why you were the, uh, uh, you were the role model for, I think, uh, the uh, Dave in the movie uh, Love Story by your friend Sigal. Yeah, that's a long time back. <laughs> very famous movie, and uh, uh, now that I think the uh, young generation very delight to know that you are that role model of that uh, hockey coach. Uh, with uh, Mr. Sigal, you were friends, you were jogging all around, and uh, please tell us about that part and what is jogging? Well, it's the magic of Harvard. Uh, he, in fact, was a professor of classics, uh, so he would have been 8, 10, 12 years older than us, and at Harvard, the unmarried professors often lived in the colleges or dormitories, and some of our classes were actually given in those colleges and dormitories. I didn't take classics, although one of my roommates did, but we knew him because he lived across the hall and he liked to go jogging at six o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. And uh, my uh, one roommate was a basketball player and the second was a baseball player and I played football and hockey so we covered four sports and he'd come in on a Sunday night and he said, you're running with me at six o'clock tomorrow morning and you're running with me at six o'clock on Tuesday morning and so on. So that's how we got to know him. We didn't realize that he was taking notes of uh, some of his interaction um, and he wrote uh, popular novels. In fact, he. Uh, wrote six or seven novels that very often involved uh, his own experiences at Harvard, including one called The Class, which was about his own class of um, Harvard graduates and how they um, navigated their way through life. So since that, this jogging is a part of your life, you, it makes you stronger at your age now, you are traveling so far and still doing so many works. Please tell us about that part. How does it, I mean, how much time you spend for sport? My wife and I both uh, generally exercise uh, pretty well every day, certainly five days a week, and, and fairly vigorous exercise so that uh, one pushes uh, one's limits. And it's something we've done as a family. We have five daughters, all of whom have been very active in sports. My number three daughter actually played uh, at Harvard on the women's team, which was a very, very good team. And now we have ten grandchildren, and uh, the ones who are walking, at least, are involved in sport. We. Uh, did a five kilometer bike ride in a Terry Fox uh, run for uh, cancer research uh, a month or so ago, and they're, they're six. Uh, I ski uh, uh, regularly with my six year old and 10 year old granddaughters, and uh, we now have the, the three and four year olds who are beginning to do a little running with us as well. So it's be very much a family affair. You were uh, running the Association of High Schools uh, or Universities in Canada. Right. And, uh, and you have been working uh, all your life for many universities, very famous universities, University of Waterloo, etc. Uh, please tell us the importance of uh, higher education for society, for the development of the economy, uh, for a country like even uh, like a Mongolia. Development. I think that sovereignty in the 21st century will no longer be defined by um, the power of one's horsemen, as uh, Genghis Khan showed us uh, seven, eight hundred years ago. Uh, by the size of one's gross national product, by uh, superiority as we usually measure them in tangible things. The sovereignty will be determined by how well a nation educates all of its people, develops their talents to the full, and then uses that talent to improve the human condition, both in one's own society and societies beyond. And so to my mind, the healthiest societies that we will see in the 21st century are inclusive in that respect and see education for all as a fundamental priority. Welcome. Because we have a lot of universities in this country, um, maybe over 100, Ten of them are state-owned. You just were at the uh, round table. Thank you for coming to this round. What a pleasure. Uh, 
sharing your thoughts on that uh, at the round table on education. And you've seen that it's a quality matter now. And several participants were talking about the uh, ranking or evalu program evaluation. Mm -hmm. How important is this periodic evaluation or program in terms of quality increase of universities? Well, I'd be even more fundamental than that. You have a very high literacy rate in Mongolia, a literacy rate that is right there leading with the world. Why is that so? It's because education has been treasured for a very long time in your country. I've just finished reading a biography of uh, Genghis Khan by Jack Weatherhead, who makes the case that I believe that Genghis Khan conquered many lands, but what he did was leave the institutions of government in place, leave the rule of law and encourage it, and encourage the circulation of ideas. And the author makes the argument that Western Europe, when Genghis Khan came to the very edges of it, was not worth conquering because it was dark. It was um, very backward. But he caused the circulation of ideas. And what caused Western Europe then to leap ahead as a civilization were three things that Genghis Khan brought. One uh, was printing and the printing press. The second was gunpowder. And the third was compass so that one could navigate the world. So with that great tradition, here we are in Mongolia, and what you are doing with your particular focus on human rights and the opportunity for each individual to advance is making those education opportunities available so, them, so that people can become self-reliant and then pass that on to their children. It's wonderful to see, and the uh, accomplishments that we have seen in this country in the last 20, 25 years are simply stunning. You know, Canada and Mongolia, uh, well, Mongolia to a large extent, of course, a resource economy. And we just, we believe that our future lays in uh, taking the resource out and we'll try with the revenue to create, diversify our economy. And I think it's a great things we can, a lot of things we can learn from your experience. How do you see that uh, opportunity in between two countries in the mining and the mining education? Well, first of all, your goal of having sustainable development is a very important one, uh, and it's very much part of economic development in our country, that we do have economic growth, and we try to accelerate it as much as we can, but it is always with respect for the environment, preserving and protecting our environment so that it will be there for our children and grandchildren so they, too, will have an opportunity to enjoy it as we have. Secondly, um, the advances in technology um, and uh, new knowledge in the extractive industries is very important to doing that well uh, and sharing uh, uh, that knowledge is the very best way of ensuring one has the best ideas in the world. Canada is very lucky. We're the second largest uh, landmass in the world. We're the largest coastal con country and so we've had a lot of experience in mining. 40% of the mining financing in the world goes through the stock exchange in Toronto. But then one has a whole gamut of mining related services that can be shared, uh, developed, mutual joint ventures uh, here in Mongolia, some of which have already uh, done well and prospered. There are many more to come. I'm told that about a third of the land mass of Mongolia has now been geographically mapped and one believes that there is one trillion dollars worth of resources within that one-third. These are fantastic opportunities, but the key, of course, is you to use them so that one builds sustainable communities, that one ensures the social infrastructure is there, one ensures that the wealth is shared widely, inclusively, with all of the people so the entire society raises. And I think that's where Canadians can be very helpful because it's been the history and tradition of our country to be inclusive in that way. In particular, Canadian higher education institutions and we're looking for the very ways to find the best uh, result of the cooperation. Particularly in education, uh, Canada has worked very hard at equality of opportunity through education. For us, that has been the, the great equalizer. We are a country largely of immigrants. Uh, most of our people came with, with no property with no status, with no power, but a firm determination that life shall be better for the children than it is for them. And the, the stepladder for that, the foundation for that was a good public education system. Now we're fortunate. Our education system is well developed and we're in a position to share it with the world. And guess what happens when you share your education with other people? It's enhanced. You were a, a lawyer 
and you wrote several books, including a book called about Canadian stock exchange, yes. Canadian capital market, mm -hmm. securities regulations. Looks like thanks to this uh, proper development of capital market, Canada benefited a lot in terms of financing mining business. Mm -hmm. What you would uh, advise or what you would share with us the, uh, in that regard, the importance of capital market? Well, I'd say three or four things. One is I'm actually just working on the fifth edition of that book, Canadian Securities Regulation, which I first wrote back in 1972 or 73. Uh, one of the most difficult things we have to deal with in that new edition is what we call systemic risk, mm -hmm. where the leverage in our economic systems gets so out of whack that great damage is done. And we had the global financial crisis that was a result of excessive leveraging. But I would say three or four things uh, that are, are important to me, having thought a lot about economic regulation of the capital markets. One is that you want to be sure the rule of law applies. Uh, two, that um, you build institutions that can be trusted, that uh, trust is important, um, that uh, deals are honored, um, fairness is there. Uh, I have an expression that one of my friend often uses, and that is that trust comes in on foot and goes out in a Ferrari. It's <laughs> slow to build, but it's very quick yeah, to very disappear. Cool. Thirdly, that as you look at the regulation of your capital markets, you should also have the broader social goals in mind, such as sustainable developments, such as good governance uh, in your in your corporations, uh, such as corporate social responsibility, where yes, shareholders are going to profit, but all of the other stakeholders are, are as well. And as you develop your economic structures in this country, um, those um, principles I think are very important because at they have at their at their very root the welfare of your people. What you said, what the important factors for capital market, you were talking about the rule of law. Right. In that regard, Canada and Mongolia, two governments are working on uh, better public governance mm -hmm. quality in this country. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you have a quite good, uh, very highly developed uh, public uh, public governance, good high quality governance. We have several even meetings, I think, up, up between governments. How do you see that down the road? Well, let me say several things about that. First of all, what you have accomplished in this country since 1990 in democratic institutions, in the rule of law, in the professionalization of your public service, uh, in the administration of your justice is simply astonishing. Uh, you are, you stand alone in this part of the world in making democracy work, uh, multi-party systems, as well as you do. Um, and it's, it's rare to see that kind of accomplishment in such a relatively short period of history. It often takes two, three, four hundred years for that to occur. Canada has been very honored to be your partner in working on some aspects of that. In particular, the pro professionalization of your public service. Our ambassador was saying to me earlier today, there's been a very interesting culture change that people that work in, quote, government jobs saw themselves as civil servants. They now see themselves as public servants. So they're not working for the government. They're working for the public. And the public interest is paramount. And I think we'll see more and more of that as you continue to strengthen the talent of your young people coming into the public service and the professionalization of those people as they exercise their skills and responsibilities and drawing from the experience of other countries and contributing to the experience of other countries so that together their public service enhances and serves the common interest in very creative and thoughtful ways. You know, I had interviewed uh, Maria Barados, who was former, I think, head of uh, public service administration there, and she told us that after political election, uh, after change of government, there were no single cases of changing the political of, uh, gov public officers. That's so key, and, and that's about a hundred year history in Canada, that one ab established a public service commission, and one established the recruitment, the hiring, the promotion, and the maintenance of public service as something independent from the political aspects of government. These are professional, public servants that serve the public sure interest. It's really independent. Here in this country, one election comes, then I wipe out everybody, and we have to recreate all institutions again and again. Well, I think it's as important as the independence of the judiciary. judiciary. That th this is an institution 
that has professional responsibilities and cannot be subject to the the whims of change that occur with political action. Now, our public service must be conscious of the fact that the legislature passes laws and the executive branch of government, the public service, must carry them out. But it's within a concept of the professional responsibility of the public servant. Uh, you have been uh, in, in charge of several movements or hearings about environmental relations and businesses. Right. Well, how to make sure that they're mining? which is certainly uh, very much deeply related to environmental damage and sometimes in good recovery. What, how, how can we make sure that that's, uh, mining, our mining is eco-friendly? Eco well, you begin with the proposition that that natural resource that you have is a gift, and it's a gift to be stewarded in a very thoughtful way. It's not just to be extracted and used to make rich or few people. It's intended to be there as a source for all people to benefit from. So that inclusivity and that public responsibility is quite key. Uh, secondly, I, I, I was the founding chair of a body in Canada in 1989, the very time when you were undergoing this peaceful revolution and this creation of modern democratic institutions of government. It was the national round table on the environment and the economy, bringing the economy and the environment together to promote what we called sustainable development, which very simply is is economic growth, but economic growth which protects and preserves and enhances the environment so it's there for our children and grandchildren as well. And that was a multi-sector table that brought four ministers of government, four people from, uh, from industry, from the private sector, four people from the environmental movements, and four people from institutions like mine, research and academic institutions, trying to bring whole of government and whole of society solutions to uh, economic development, in particular mining. And from that came this rather inclusive approach that we want to develop our resources uh, where appropriate. We want to extract them, but we want to leave uh, the footprint as small as possible, and we want to ensure that we can have communities that don't rise and fall because a particular resource has to be there at their back door and use that particular economic engine to create a, a broader economy and a broader community that can sustain itself into the future. So my last question is about how to make sure that mining provinces and non-mining provinces mutually benefit from their mining. Mm -hmm. What is the particular things to do? Well, if a particular region of the country has the 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 gift of, uh, of a mine or oil or a very fertile agricultural area, you want to be sure that that is developed and it produces the wealth. And it will be uh, certainly beneficial for the people in the immediate region, but that is also the wealth of the nation. And as one has an equity participation by the government, as one takes royalties from that, as one taxes those ventures, those revenues then go to build the other important features of society, the schools, uh, the roads, uh, the electricity distributed system, the hospitals, the health care, so that the entire society benefits. It's very interesting. There's a book that I often quote called Why Nations Fail. And um, it was came out of a, a research project in Canada by uh, James Robertson, a scholar at Harvard, and uh, Darren Misiglou, a scholar at uh, Massachusetts Institute at MIT. And their thesis is very simple, that those nations that are inclusive in their politics and in their economics rise and their societies get healthier. Those that are extractive in their economics and their politics begin to fail. Now note it's not inclusive and exclusive, a 180 degree relationship. It's inclusive which are positive and then extractive in the broad sense of that meaning which is more like a 145 degree relationship. And so one has to avoid the, the strict, narrow, extractive mentality, and one must constantly emphasize that broad, inclusive mentality. I think that would uh, let Mongolia be more inclusive, yes. and I think your trip and uh, your visit and uh, that uh, you are on my interview sharing your thoughts will be a good step towards that inclusiveness. Well, thank you, and we in Canada are so honored to be uh, your partners in so many important endeavors. Thank you very much, sir. Pleasure. Thank you.